traditional cultures had what we could call a warrior's path. And it was a path all the way through life where people had training early on. Uh, the youth stayed with elder warriors and learned stories and skills and philosophy and spirituality to help them be warriors all the way through childhood. When they finally were initiated in the combat situation, it was brief, uh, often only one battle, maybe only a few minutes long. The elders were with them, watching over them. Their holy people uh, would be accompanying them to the battlefield, praying and watching over them as well, and stopping the battles when they got too costly. And then the warriors would be given extensive ceremony and ritual by the elders and the medicine people and the entire community when they returned. And they'd be initiated as warriors and expected to serve through the entire life cycle. Um, and so the, the path of what we would call military service was actually a part of usually a man's life for his entire life with support, guidance, uh, community, honor, and involvement all the way through. And when the former commander-in-chief said, don't worry about the wars, the troops will carry it, you go shopping, that was a recipe for post-traumatic stress disorder for, and breakdown for the entire culture. Because world warrior traditions teach us that there is a social contract between the warriors and the civilians. There, and there is a necessary reciprocal tending relationship in this contract. Warriors are the people who are sworn to preserve and protect us whenever we are endangered. And so when, when they're ordered to create a circle of protection around the community, they go out and do that and are willing to sacrifice their lives to provide that protection. When the threat is over, a proper social order says that the warriors come home and then this, we civilians make a circle of protection and tending and caregiving around them and they come into the center because they're hurt, they're confused. War hurts, it has to hurt. And for us to medicate it, to tell the public they don't have to feel it, to tell our veterans there's something wrong with them because they're hurting is wrong. So it is our job, no matter what our politics, this transcends politics, it's our job as civilians to tend the returning warriors by bringing them into the center of the community. 2,500 years ago, Aeschylus, the first Greek tragedian, who was a combat veteran and whose brother was killed at Marathon, said, the first casualty of war is truth. As long as we don't let our veterans tell their stories and the public doesn't hear them, that casualty, truth, remains untended. So some of our impetus in our Soldiers' Heart programming is to help restore truth to the war experience and create every opportunity possible for veterans to and active duty military to tell their truth to the public and ask the public to help witness the stories, feel the pain with our vets, and carry the burden and the responsibility together. When a person goes through the military experience, their entire civilian personality is deconstructed. It has to be. People have to receive a different set of values, um, a different lifestyle. They must learn discipline. Um, and there's some transcendent values that we all need to be willing to sacrifice oneself for a cause greater than oneself, to be absolutely devoted to the people on, next to you so that your life is dependent on their, theirs and their lives are dependent on you. To face terrifying conditions and be able to behave well on behalf of the group and the nation. To realize how precious and fragile life is such that we have to be really careful if and when we ever decide to harm it. These are transcendent values that the military teaches. Once identity is entirely changed through the military experience, and then if a person is in combat, the seal is complete. A person is different forever. And for us to say, come back and now you're one of our veterans, but be a civilian again, is wrong, it's inaccurate, and for many it's impossible. 
Rather, we need a different identity, which I call warrior or spiritual warrior. Some people like the word guardian or elder um, for the returnees, and we work to help them keep growing a new identity that includes everything they experienced in the military. Thank and you. as we grow a larger identity, the traumatic impact shrinks in proportion. Civilians who have been to war don't really have a place for the trauma of combat, but elder warriors who have been to war and are returning, uh, returning to tell us the truth about it do have a place, an honored place for the traumatic times. Traditional societies understood that combat was so severe and transformative that they expected a person to break down. And so what we need, rather than rushing people home and saying, uh, and fighting over whether or not they have PTSD, what, how we could recreate the period of isolation and tending, which was not sending people back to their families and to their community, to their ordinary jobs immediately, but rather expecting that they were in pain and broken down and the elders and the, the priests and priestesses, the sacred people of the tradition, tended people in isolation, expecting that they had uh, pollution and upset from war. The returning warriors were not allowed out of isolation until they could say, yes, I wanted this experience in order to be a warrior in my people's service. Much of PTSD is the mind and the heart and the soul screaming, no, 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 it was horrible. And I banish this experience and I don't want to feel it or remember it. Uh, and that was true in traditional cultures as well. People hated killing. They vomited, they cried, they screamed. They cursed their elders for making them do it. Eventually, the self ex can accept what he or she did and say, yes, I chose to do this not because I wanted to hurt or kill, but because I wanted to be a warrior. I wanted to serve my people in this way. In communities where faith organizations have created veteran ministry like we're doing here, those faith organizations will include purification in whatever their own tradition is. Um, so that's more common and more comfortable. However, many veterans are truly looking for an intensive purification experience because the combat experience is so intense and they want something that is equally intense but in the direction of release and creativity rather than death and destruction. The Veterans Administration in some places around the country is inviting Native American teachers onto the hospital grounds in order to provide sweat lodges for vets. So the Veterans Administration is slowly but steadily realizing that the problems of PTSD are profound and complex and we, they, we need partnerships between military and governmental and civilian healers and organizations, and we need far more holistic and complex means for responding to PTSD than they've ever done before. And many, many veterans feel that, that uh, they feel that the betrayal uh, upon coming home to themselves and their comrades was far more traumatic than the experience of combat itself. I was willing to do this for my country and to sacrifice this much. I expected combat to hurt and maybe even kill me. But I also expected my people to love and honor and support me when I came home. And I didn't get that part. And that's a worse betrayal than anything that happened downrange. The individual veterans' war stories are the warrior mythology of the culture. And we are meant to hear it and receive it. And the more we do that, the less burden it is on the veteran. Um, and so psychotherapy, individual and group, are both forms of storytelling. But it's happening to one before one person or with other people like yourself. So that's necessary and helpful, but it's not sufficient because the responsibility for war and the truth about war experiences is supposed to be passed to the entire tribe or community to carry together. And so in our activities uh, uh, and programs, 
will have graduated experiences. If somebody might start in therapy with me and get comfortable storytelling just to one trustworthy person, and then we might go to a veterans group so vets feel most safe and comfortable and trusting with other vets, and eventually we'll go out into the community. Um, storytelling, which will happen today in this church ministry, or bringing veterans to schools, high schools and colleges, or uh, some communities have veterans speak out programs in libraries or community centers. There's many ways of creating storytelling. Traditional cultures had rituals that we would call, uh, describe as transfer of responsibility, where the community says to the veteran, I've heard your stories, I know what you did. Now, we as a community transfer the responsibility for the destruction and death you participated in from you to us. You did this in our name, so we are all responsible. We will not leave the burden of guilt on you. If we leave it there, it can break the veteran. But rather, it's all of our responsibility to evaluate, to decide politically what we believe and when and whether we use violence for, to uh, rebuild our people and other people we've harmed. So restitution is the community taking responsibility and helping the veteran um, take actions to rebuild him or herself. So we also do a lot of reconciliation and atonin, atonement and restoration practices, which is also about repairing the break between the veteran and the community. We're using up a, a much more limited number tro of troops for all of our combat operations. So the average number of days in combat in a year's deployment is over 200 for the, these contemporary troops. Among our Vietnam veterans, we lost 58,000 killed in action. And we've had over 130,000 suicides of Vietnam veterans. Wow. Okay, that's over twice the number. Thus far, in Iraq and Afghanistan, we've lost something over 5,000 in Iraq and 1,000 in Afghanistan, so 6,000 combat deaths so far. We've had over 30,000 suicides of these people. 20% of active duty troops and as much as 40% of guards and National Guardsmen and Reservists are coming back with PTSD. These are astronomical numbers, and we could go through substance abuse and divorce and child abuse and homicide and imprisoned populations. In every critical area of disability, veterans are represented in two to three hundred percent levels of their uh, numbers in the population. So they are really hurting. And it's also not necessarily about politics. Some of the troops report, especially those in Afghanistan, believe in the cause and aren't questioning the political rightness of their being there, but conditions are so horrible and the recycling through multiple deployments is so destructive uh, and there's so little adequate support at home that traumatic breakdown is inevitable. And let me add, the technology of this destruction has become so severe that it is beyond the capacity of a human being to adapt to without breakdown. King Saul and King David had PTSD, Noah had PTSD, uh, the man with unclean spirits in the New Testament sounds like somebody with PTSD whom Jesus healed, um, and on and on. There are many names. There was nostalgia, homesickness, uh, it's just American Civil War is called Soldier's Heart. All these are better names because they're closer to the descriptive truth of what they are, and they include emotions and spirituality. Um, veterans appreciate being recognized as having a wound, but they hate the name post-traumatic stress disorder because it pathologizes them, it sounds like a mental illness and it's not, and it dishonors the wound. Another lesson from traditional warrior cultures is that we must honor the wound, dress it up, uh, salute it in public places. When veterans were denied the Purple Heart last year by a federal commission, um, if for PTSD, it was another betrayal to them. I am really wounded and I thought with recognizing PTSD that our, my country is beginning to honor the invisible wounds, and it didn't. In traditional cultures, uh, wounds were dressed. Um, warriors with scars would decorate the scars. They would even 
paint the scars on their war horses. Mm-hmm. And the entire culture would know that's an honorable veteran, not a homeless veteran to avoid on the streets, but an honorable warrior who has served us. And honor and gratitude would be, would be exchanged all the time. And that's what we need to do.